Ronnie Richter of Bland Richter filed a motion on August 3rd in answer to two motions that were filed on Friday, July 28, 2023. This motion is called a limited appearance to disavow interest, and it's filed on behalf of Tony Satterfield and Brian Harriet, Gloria Satterfield's sons. Gloria was the housekeeper for the Murdoch family for over 20 years. She died after a fall on the stairs in front of the home made famous for being the site of the murders of Maggie and Paul. Alex caused a suit against his own insurance company with the help of his good friend Corey Fleming. He then stole the entire settlement of over $4 million. There are several videos related to this saga here on my channel. If you've missed the details, be sure and look that up. The case we're talking about today began with a federal complaint filed on April 22, 2022 that was originally Nautilus Insurance Company against Alex alone. It was later changed to, and still remains, Alex, Corey Fleming, his former law firm, Chad Westendorf, and Palmetto State Bank. After Alex stole and spent their settlement, Gloria's son's attorneys, Eric Bland and Ronnie Richter, fought and won them a new settlement against Alex's law firm, Corey Fleming the Accomplice, his law firm, and Palmetto State Bank. They've been awarded over $7 million for that. Now that Alex is being called on to answer for his thievery, he's trying to strategize how to make others pay for his mistakes. Of interest is the fact that the settlement paid to Tony and Brian came from several sources and none from Alex himself. So to clear it up, Alex stole their settlement money. Other parties paid it back. Now that Alex is being sued by the insurance company whose funds he stole, he wants them to take the money from Gloria's sons. The money that was awarded by other people who were all cheated by Alex. And that's the gist of the two motions filed on Friday. So let's get started. Hey everyone, glad you're here. This is Legal Updates with Cassidy O'Connell. Welcome. Before I begin on Bland Richter's motion, I want to point out how this motion filed by Philip Barber and Jim Griffin starts out with the same sob story they preface a lot of their motions with. I'm sure the judges just love hearing this. More pity party stories about his rehab and throw in another mention of the alleged failed suicide attempt. This just made me wonder what he would have said to any of the defendants he sued. Imagine the tire companies, ambulance companies, car companies, railroads, you name it, that Alex sued. Imagine them saying, well, you can't hold us responsible because we were on drugs and we killed our families. And yet, Alex, who comes from a long line of not just attorneys, but solicitors, and Dick Harputlian, a respected attorney with a long career, and they want to stand up in court with straight faces and say he stole millions of dollars from these vulnerable clients. But he's the real victim here because he killed his family and took drugs. I don't know about you, but I just want to burn this whole page. Pages 2 to 5 retell the whole story of Gloria's fall, Alex's schemes for an insurance payout, and subsequent theft of the money. But in the description of the scheme, it keeps saying that there was no other witness to the dogs having been there. This is completely disregarding that Maggie and Paul, who by the way were the only two people present during the fall, and though they didn't witness it with their eyes, they said that they heard it and immediately came out. Both gave sworn testimony that the dogs were what caused the fall. So Alex and his team are directly accusing Maggie and Paul of lying. Were they lying? No one will ever know, but to say in a court document that no other witness mentioned the dogs is an absolute lie. The bottom of page 5 mentions the Nautilus filing and points to an amended complaint filed on May 11th, which reads, Murdoch stated he heard Miss Satterfield say that Murdoch's dogs had caused her fall. Murdoch repeated the statement on March 29, 2018 during an interview with Bryant McGowan an insurance investigator. Now, back to the original document. On page 6, it goes on to say that Alex answered the amended complaint. He admitted that he invented the story about dogs knocking Miss Satterfield down for the purpose of causing Lloyds of London and Nautilus Insurance Company to pay to settle a false insurance claim. He further admits that he stole the settlement proceeds. It then cites document number 113, which we've covered here before. 
At the bottom of page 6, we get to the heart of the matter. He asserts an affirmative defense that Nautilus has failed to join the Satterfield parties, who are necessary parties under Rule 19A1 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, because they claim an interest relating to the subject of this action. He wants the Satterfield parties to be added to the list of defendants. Can you believe these guys? Let's not forget he knew these boys almost their entire lives and that Brian is considered a vulnerable adult and without his mom's support he ended up losing his home while Alex was busy spending their settlement money. It goes on to state the legal standard for this. A. In that person's absence, the court cannot accord complete relief among existing parties, or b. That person claims an interest relating to the subject of an action and is so situated that disposing of the action in the person's absence may, one, as a practical matter, impair or impede the person's ability to protect the interest, or two, leave an existing party subject to a substantial risk of incurring double, multiple, or otherwise inconsistent obligations because of the interest. So. The real risk here for them is Alex might have to answer for his own crimes. They're so bold as to state in the arguments, the court should order Nautilus to join them in this action. They then claim that without Alex lying to the insurance company, there would be no fees in the first place, and that thus the only claim they would have against Alex is one of emotional distress. That's a lot of assumptions. It first of all assumes that the court is going to believe him when he now says that the dogs had nothing to do with the fall, even though Maggie and Paul's sworn statement says that's why she fell. It assumes that the court will put faith in the word of a man who lied about his alibi until video footage Paul had on his phone made it irrefutable. The word of a man who claimed a stranger shot him on the side of the road, even providing a detailed description of the man. The word of a man who spent over a decade lying to his clients, partners, friends, family, colleagues, and the court. It then goes on. The Satterfield parties would have no valid claim to any portion of the proceeds of his insurance fraud, and so could not complain that Mr. Murdoch failed to deliver a portion of the proceeds of the fraud to them. Their claim against Mr. Murdoch would be best stated as a complaint for intentional infliction of emotional distress. In South Carolina, the law called outrage an apt word for Mr. Murdoch's conduct. And here's the real point. Alex doesn't want to take on the whole obligation of correcting a mess he himself made and thinks that would just be unfair. In the next paragraph, this action therefore exposes Mr. Murdoch to a substantial risk of incurring double, multiple, or otherwise inconsistent obligations because of the interest the Satterfield parties claim in the subject of this action. And now after saying that, they want us to think that Alex is being altruistic here. Going on, of course, that risk cannot affect Mr. Murdoch's quality of life. He's in prison, and every asset he once had is in the custody of the receivers the Satterfield parties requested be appointed. If Nautilus obtains a judgment against Mr. Murdoch with no offsets for the third-party recoveries the Satterfield parties have obtained, the only effect will be to reduce funds available to Mr. Murdoch's many other victims. If you believe him, he's simply thinking of Nautilus and his other victims. His money has been tied up by the mean old receivers guarding his money, and if they take some of his money, it will hurt the other victims, but it won't hurt Alex in prison. We're supposed to believe that? When was Alex ever concerned about his victims? Going on, the restatement expresses the common sense principle that if restitution for stolen money is given to the wrong party, the actual victim has a claim on that restitution, even if the source of the restitution is a third party paying on behalf of or because of perceived joint liability with the thief. This statement actually makes sense, except for when you read that bottom part. If the third party is perceived to have joint liability with the thief, since when do Gloria's sons have joint liability with Alex? He completely deceived them. They weren't working together with him. We also have to assume that Alex is now telling the truth and that Paul and Maggie were lying. We also have to believe that there would have been no settlement at all 
without his story of the dog, and we have to believe him with no one to back him up, even though he's a known liar. Then we see this statement that sounds more like it should come from Eric Bland and Ronnie Richter because it's so helpful to the Satterfields. It says, based on the adjuster communications contained in the claims file, it appears Nautilus never believed the claim about dogs was valid, but nonetheless agreed to pay the Satterfield parties. So this statement says that Nautilus paid it even though they did not believe it was the dogs. So how can he say it wasn't the dogs so you shouldn't have been paid? They just say right here, they paid even though they didn't believe it was the dogs. But Alex wants us to believe that had he not said that about the dogs, that they never would have paid. It goes on, Mr. Murdoch's burden is only to show that the Satterfield's parties claim that he stole the claim payment from them is inconsistent with Nautilus's claim that he stole the claim payment from Nautilus and creates a risk of double obligations to repay the claim payment. That little word dance does not address the reality of what happened. This is not a lawsuit of the Satterfields asking for money from Alex. This is Nautilus asking for their money back from Alex. To illustrate, Nautilus sent money to Gloria Sons via Alex, which should have been a safe way to do so. Alex kept that money instead of giving it to Gloria's sons. Once it was discovered, the bank, lawyers, law firms, etc. paid Gloria's sons restitution because basically they all dropped the ball here too. Someone else bailed Alex out and paid the Satterfields. So now Alex thinks he shouldn't have to pay back the millions that he stole. So now Alex says, don't come for me, go take it back from Gloria's sons. They just got a bunch of money. So now Alex has kept the stolen money. Gloria's sons, according to Alex, should have to give Nautilus the money from the banks and the firms. Who's gonna pay the banks and the firms back? Because what we have here is Nautilus gets reimbursed, they have money. Alex spent his money a long time ago, but not only the Satterfields lose out, but now also the people who paid restitution for Alex's thievery, they lose too. Now they have no money. How is that fair? Satterfield attorneys argue that this is a separate matter that has nothing to do with the Satterfields. This is Alex paying back the people he now says he committed fraud against. He's so gung-ho for saying he lied to them to get their money, but he doesn't want to have to cough that money back up. If the Satterfields should not have been given that money, isn't that a matter for the people who actually gave them money to decide, not Alex? These are two completely different matters. The document goes on, Mr. Murdoch does not know whether Nautilus has a superior claim to anything the Satterfield parties have recovered from third parties, but he respectfully submits that if the court determines Nautilus is entitled to restitution for the money stolen from it, equity requires that the restitution should come from the party that has already received a double recovery for this same theft. What is this double recovery? They received one recovery. Alex took the whole settlement the first time. The document concludes by demanding the court dismiss the action if they don't join the Satterfields so that the money can be recovered from them instead of Alex. Like the Parker Group absorbed the cost of the boat crash instead of Alex. So now we go back to Eric's filing for limited appearance to disavow interest. He says limited appearance because they're not so far named in the lawsuit, but he's had to step in because of Alex's demands. And he states they have not claimed any interest in this litigation. He then starts to discuss the federal rule and says there's a two-step inquiry for courts to determine whether a party is necessary and indispensable to the litigation. The first question under Rule 19a is whether a party is necessary to a proceeding because of its relationship to the matter under consideration. Second, if the court determines that the party is necessary, it must then determine whether the party is indispensable to the action. The decisions must be made pragmatically in the context of the substance of each case, and courts must take into account the possible prejudice to all parties, including those not before it. The moving party has the burden of showing that the absent party is necessary under Rule 19. So what do we think? Have they shown 
that it's necessary? It goes on, according to Rule 19a, a party is necessary if a, in that person's absence, the court cannot accord complete relief among existing parties, or b, that person claims an interest relating to the subject of an action, and is so situated that disposing of the action in the person's absence may, one, as a practical matter, impair or impede the person's ability to protect the interest, or two, leave an existing party subject to a substantial risk of incurring double, multiple, or otherwise inconsistent obligations because of the interest. After citing cases that have won on matters like this, he goes on to say, to be clear, the Satterfields have not claimed an interest relating to the subject of the action. Rather, it is the defendant Murdoch that has tried to claim that their interests are at stake, not the Satterfields. And then it concludes with this note. The Satterfields claim no interest in this litigation. In fact, the Satterfields are at a loss in understanding what theoretical interest of theirs that they could claim. Their disputes with Murdoch's have been litigated to conclusion in a form of a confession of judgment from Murdoch in favor of the Satterfields in the amount of 4,300,000. The Satterfields are not necessary and or indispensable parties as defined by Rule 19 and the case law interpreting the rule. And next we'll move on to the final document and that is plaintiff's motion to amend pleading. It was filed right on the deadline, which was July 28th, and we learn the deadline for discovery will be November 28th, 2023, with the trial not before date of April 1st, 2024. We also learn that three depositions have been convened by Nautilus. No word on who they were, but hopefully that will find its way to the public. In part three, we have the proposed second amended pleading where we see the reason for this amendment is that it reflects new causes of action based upon information learned since the amended complaint was filed. The new claims relate to the same transaction or occurrence as the existing claims and rely on much the same evidence. So it provides two exhibits, exhibit A and B. A is a clean version of this amended complaint and B is a red line version, which is what I'll outline today since it shows us what the differences are. First off, it removes the United States that was originally on here as a respondent, and it was on there because of a federal subpoena that was issued to Nautilus. Next, we see them pointing out the role that Chad Westendorf and Palmetto State Bank actually played, and rightly so. If you missed the episodes where we went through his deposition, be sure to watch that when you have time. The man seriously sat there and pretended that as a bank vice president, he did not understand his role as a personal representative or even know the meaning of the word fiduciary. He's currently trying to get excluded from this suit. He just filed the documents this week as well, and I will cover that soon. Moving on, we see clarifications of things that were learned through their investigation, and that's most of what we see here. For example, initially it was thought to be only insurance fraud, but now, based on what they've learned, they've added bank fraud as well. We see they discovered how the scheme played out, from Alex suggesting the family sue his insurance, to Corey's role in it, and how the money was then moved around. This line at the end of the paragraph reminds me of something Judge Gurgle said during Russell Lafitte's sentencing hearing earlier this week. He said Alex could not have committed these crimes without the help of Russell Lafitte. Unfortunately for Westendorf, Gurgle is the judge in this case too. Now this line is so much like the words right out of Judge Gurgle's mouth. Referring to Chad Westendorf, Russell Lafitte, and the bank, it says a key component to the scheme to defraud Nautilus without which the scheme could not have been effected. So good luck trying to get out of this suit with this judge. One of the takeouts that surprised me was them saying that Alex was threatening and abusive toward the adjuster in order to get the full policy limit payout. But then I did find it later in the document, so it's not taken out, it's just been moved to a different location. Now we're into the mishandling of the money, and it reminds us that Westendorf received the check and a letter setting forth the condition that the funds be held in trust until an order approving the settlement was signed and filed, but that instead he immediately endorsed the funds over to Corey and his law firm, where they were then dispersed to fake forge and subsequently stolen. 
And if you saw the Chad Westendorf deposition, you'll remember that it was Judge Carmen Mullins that helped Alex and Corey to allow that these settlement orders were not properly filed in court in order to help Alex hide the fact that he'd won the settlement because Mallory Beach's family had begun their lawsuit against Alex for the boat crash. It goes on to show what they've learned about Corey's hand in the crimes. He was also in receipt of instructions to hold the funds and that there was testimony from the real Forge that showed Corey was fully aware of the process for dealing with Forge with real structured settlements, which does not follow the way that he cut the check to Alex. Now this next part has always bothered me too. There was no effort at all made on behalf of the clients, and this was true with all the victim cases, not just Gloria Satterfield's. No one was looking out for the clients at all, not the lawyers, not the bankers, not the judges. Now here's that second disbursement that we've heard about before, and all parties involved, again, knew the proper procedures for structured settlements and settlements in general. None of these people were unaware that what they were doing was wrong. The next several points point out all the bank did to help Alex steal money, something we've covered many times here. It also points out that Alex would send clients to the bank to take out loans at what's described as exorbitant interest rates that were to be repaid from the eventual settlements. So it looks like they used absolutely every form they could take to get money from these poor people. It also shows that Alex was able to get this stolen money not just into one account, but into at least three accounts at Palmetto State Bank. And this doesn't even mention the Bank of America accounts. Point 16 covers how legal process and influence was used to carry out the scheme and calls it a coordinated effort by the co-conspirators. And here's where we find the threatening and abuse toward the adjuster. It was not removed, just moved to this place in the document. And then we get to the 14 causes of action. The first cause of action, fraud, didn't change much. And the second one, conspiracy, just outlines the fraudulent activity that we just covered. The same with the third cause of action, negligence. It also goes over what we've covered and know to be true of this case. Things that weren't known when the original complaint was filed or things that they didn't know the extent of until later are now formally added to the complaint and the rest of the 14 causes of action are all updated as well to reflect the things discovered in the process and that's basically what the causes of action are. It's not new information, but that concludes this amended pleading. So far, no hearing dates have been set to determine the outcome of the motions that we've gone over. As soon as it happens, I will update you. Until then, this is Cassidy O'Connell saying stay well and stay tuned.